Chapter 8 of What Katie Did. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hattie Lennox. What Katie Did by Susan Coolidge. Chapter 8 Tomorrow. Tomorrow I will begin, thought Katie as she dropped asleep that night. How often we all do so. And what a pity it is that when morning comes and tomorrow is today, we so frequently wake up feeling quite differently, careless or impatient, and not a bit inclined to do the fine things we planned overnight. Sometimes it seems as if there must be wicked little imps in the world, who were kept tied up so long as the sun shines, but who creep into our bedrooms when we are asleep to tease us and ruffle our tempers. Else, why, when we go to rest good-natured and pleasant, should we wake up so cross? Now there was Katie. Her last sleepy thought was an intention to be an angel from that time on, and as much like Cousin Helen as she could, and when she opened her eyes she was all out of sorts, and as fractious as a bear. Old Mary said that she got out of bed on the wrong side. I wonder, by the way, if anybody will ever be wise enough to tell us which side that is, so that we may always choose the other. How comfortable it would be if they could. You know how, if we begin the day in a cross mood, all sorts of unfortunate accidents seem to occur to add to our vexations. The very first thing Katie did this morning was to break her precious vase, the one cousin Helen had given her. It was standing on the bureau with a little cluster of blush roses in it. The bureau had a swing glass. While Katie was brushing her hair, the glass tipped a little so that she could not see. At a good-humored moment, this accident wouldn't have troubled her much, but being out of temper to begin with, it made her angry. She gave the glass a violent push. The lower part swung forward. There was a smash, and the first thing Katie knew, the blush roses lay scattered all over the floor, and Cousin Helen's pretty present was ruined. Katie just sat down on the carpet and cried as hard as she had been Phil himself. Aunt Izzy heard her lamenting and came in. "'I'm very sorry,' she said, picking up the broken glass, "'but it's no more than I expected. You're so careless, Katie.' Now don't sit there in that foolish way. Get up and dress yourself. You'll be late to breakfast. What's the matter? asked Papa, noticing Katie's red eyes as she took her seat at the table. I've broken my vase, said Katie dolefully. It was extremely careless of you to put it in such a dangerous place, said her aunt. You might have known that the glass would swing and knock it off. Then, seeing a big tear fall in the middle of Katie's plate, she added, "'Really, Katie, you're too big to behave like a baby. Why, Dory would be ashamed to do so. Pray control yourself.' This snub did not improve Katie's temper. She went on with her breakfast in sulky silence. "'What are you all going to do today?' asked Dr. Carr, hoping to give things a more cheerful turn. "'Swing!' cried John and Dory, both together. "'Alexander's put us up a splendid one in the woodshed.' "'No, you're not,' said Aunt Izzy in a positive tone. "'The swing is not to be used till tomorrow. "'Remember that, children, not till tomorrow, "'and not then unless I give you leave.' "'This was unwise of Aunt Izzy. "'She would better have explained farther. "'The truth was that Alexander, in having put up the swing, "'had cracked one of the staples which fastened it to the roof. "'He bent to get a new one in the course of the day, "'and meantime he had cautioned Miss Carr to let no one use the swing, "'because it really was not safe.' If she had told this to the children, all would have been right, but Aunt Izzy's theory was that young people must obey their elders without explanation. John and Elsie and Dory all pouted when they heard this order. Elsie recovered her good humor first. "'I don't care,' she said, "'cause I'm going to be very busy. I've got to write a letter to Cousin Helen about something.' Elsie could never quite pronounce the T-H. "'What?' asked Clover." "'Oh, something,' answered Elsie, wagging her head mysteriously. "'None of the rest of you must know. Cousin Helen said so. It's a secret she and me has got.' "'I don't believe Cousin Helen said so at all,' said Katie crossly. "'She wouldn't tell secrets to a silly little girl like you.' "'Yes, she would, too,' retorted Elsie angrily. "'She said I was just as good to trust as if I was ever so big. "'And she said I was her pet. So there, Katie Carr!' "'Stop disputing,' said Aunt Izzy. "'Katie, your top drawer is all out of order. "'I never saw anything look so badly. "'Go upstairs at once and straighten it before you do anything else. "'Children, you must keep in the shade this morning. "'It's too hot for you to be running about in the sun. "'Elsie, go into the kitchen and tell Debbie I want to speak to her.' "'Yes,' said Elsie in an important tone. "'And afterwards I'm coming back to write my letter to Cousin Helen.' "'Katie went slowly up the stairs, dragging one foot after the other.' It was a warm, languid day. 
Her head ached a little, and her eyes smarted and felt heavy from crying so much. Everything seemed dull and hateful. She said to herself that Aunt Izzy was very unkind to make her work in vacation, and she pulled the top drawer open with a disgusted groan. It must be confessed that Miss Izzy was right. A bureau drawer could hardly look worse than this one did. It reminded one of the White Knight's recipe for pudding, which began with blotting paper and ended with sealing wax and gunpowder. All sorts of things were mixed together, as if somebody had put in a long stick and stirred them well up. There were books and paint boxes and bits of scribbled paper and lead pencils and brushes. Stocking legs had come unrolled and twisted themselves about pocket handkerchiefs and ends of ribbons and linen collars. Ruffles, all crushed out of shape, stuck up from under the heavier things, and sundry little paper boxes lay empty on top, the treasures they once held having sifted down to the bottom of the drawer and disappeared beneath the general mass. It took much time and patience to bring order out of this confusion, but Katie knew that Aunt Izzy would be up by and by, and she dared not stop till all was done. By the time it was finished, she was very tired. Going downstairs, she met Elsie coming up with a slate in her hand, which, as soon as she saw Katie, she put behind her. "'You mustn't look,' she said. "'It's my letter to Cousin Helen. Nobody but me knows the secret. It's all written, and I'm going to send it to the office. See, there's a stamp on it.' and she exhibited a corner of the slate. Sure enough, there was a stamp stuck on the frame. "'You little goose,' said Katie impatiently. "'You can't send that to the post office. Here, give me the slate. I'll copy what you've written on paper, and Papa will give you an envelope.' "'No, no!' cried Elsie, struggling. "'You mustn't. You'll see what I've said, and Cousin Helen said I wasn't to tell. It's a secret. Let go of my slate, I say. I'll tell Cousin Helen what a mean girl you are, and then she won't love you a bit.' "'There, then, take your old slate,' said Katie, giving her a vindictive push. Elsie slipped, screamed, caught at the banisters, missed them, and rolling over and over fell with a thump on the hall floor. It wasn't much of a fall, only half a dozen steps, but the bump was a hard one, and Elsie roared as if she had been half killed. Aunt Izzy and Mary came rushing to the spot. "'Katie pushed me!' sobbed Elsie. She wanted me to tell her my secret, and I wouldn't. She's a bad, naughty girl. Well, Katie Carr, I should think you'd be ashamed of yourself, said Aunt Izzy, wreaking your temper on your poor little sister. I think your cousin Helen will be surprised when she hears this. There, there, Elsie, don't cry any more, dear. Come upstairs with me. I'll put on some arnica, and Katie shan't hurt you again. So they went upstairs. Katie, left below, felt very miserable. "'repentant, defiant, discontented, and sulky all at once. "'She knew in her heart that she had not meant to hurt Elsie, "'but was thoroughly ashamed of that push. "'But Aunt Izzy's hint about telling Cousin Helen "'had made her too angry to allow of her confessing this to herself or anybody else. "'I don't care,' she murmured, choking back her tears. "'Elsie is a real crybaby anyway, and Aunt Izzy always takes her part, "'just because I told the little silly not to go and send a great heavy slate to the post office.' She went out by the side door into the yard. As she passed the shed, the new swing caught her eye. How exactly like Aunt Izzy, she thought, ordering children not to swing until she gives them leave. I suppose she thinks it's too hot or something. I shan't mind her anyhow. She seated herself in the swing. It was a first-rate one, with a broad, comfortable seat and thick new ropes. The seat hung just the right distance from the floor. Alexander was a capital hand at putting up swings, and the woodshed was the nicest possible spot in which to have one. It was a big place, with a very high roof. There was not much wood left in it just now, and the little there was was piled neatly about the sides of the shed, so as to leave plenty of room. The place felt cool and dark, and the motion of the swing seemed to set the breeze blowing. It waved Katie's hair like a great fan, and made her dreamy and quiet. All sorts of sleepy ideas began to filt through her brain. Swinging to and fro, like the pendulum of a great clock, she gradually rose higher and higher, driving herself along by the motion of her body, and striking the floor smartly with her foot at every sweep. Now she was at the top of the high arched door. Then she could almost touch the crossbeam above it, and through the small square window could see pigeons sitting and pluming themselves on the eaves of the barn, and white clouds blowing over the blue sky. She had never swung so high before. It was like flying, she thought, and she bent and curved more strongly in the seat, trying to send herself yet higher and graze the roof with her toes. Suddenly, at the very highest point of the sweep, there was a sharp noise of cracking. 
The swing gave a violent twist, spun half round, and tossed Katie into the air. She clutched the rope, felt it dragged from her grasp, then down, down, down she fell. All grew dark, and she knew no more. When she opened her eyes, she was lying on the sofa in the dining room. Clover was kneeling beside her with a pale, scared face, and Aunt Izzy was dropping something cold and wet on her forehead. "'What's the matter?' said Katie, faintly. "'Oh, she's alive! She's alive!' And Clover put her arms round Katie's neck and sobbed. "'Hush, dear.' Aunt Izzy's voice sounded unusually gentle. "'You've had a bad tumble, Katie. Don't you recollect?' "'A tumble? Oh, yes. Out of the swing.' said Katie, as it all came slowly back to her. Did the rope break, Aunt Izzy? I can't remember about it. No, Katie, not the rope. The staple drew out of the roof. It was a cracked one and not safe. Don't you recollect my telling you not to swing today? Did you forget? No, Aunt Izzy, I didn't forget. I... But here Katie broke down. She closed her eyes and big tears rolled from under the lids. Don't cry, whispered Clover, crying herself. Please don't. Aunt Izzy isn't going to scold you. But Katie was too weak and shaken not to cry. I think I'd like to go upstairs and lie on the bed, she said, but when she tried to get off the sofa, everything swam before her, and she fell back on the pillow. Why, I can't stand up, she gasped, looking very much frightened. I'm afraid you've given yourself a sprain somewhere, said Aunt Izzy, who looked rather frightened herself. You'd better lie still a while, dear, before you try to move. Ah, here's the doctor. Well, I am glad. And she went forward to meet him. It wasn't Papa, but Dr. Alsop, who lived quite near them. I'm so relieved that you could come, Aunt Izzy said. My brother has gone out of town not to return till tomorrow, and one of the little girls has had a bad fall. Dr. Alsop sat down beside the sofa and counted Katie's pulse. Then he began feeling all over her. Can you move this leg? he asked. Katie gave a feeble kick. And this? The kick was a good deal more feeble. "'Did that hurt you?' asked Dr. Alsop, seeing a look of pain on her face. "'Yes, a little,' replied Katie, trying hard not to cry. "'And your back, eh? Was the pain high up or low down?' And the doctor punched Katie's spine for some minutes, making her squirm uneasily. "'I'm afraid she's done some mischief,' he said at last. "'But it's impossible to tell yet exactly what. "'It may only be a twist, or a slight sprain,' he added, seeing the look of terror on Katie's face. You'd better get her upstairs and undress her as soon as you can, Miss Carr. I'll leave a prescription to rub her with. And Dr. Alsop took out a bit of paper and began to write. Oh, must I go to bed, said Katie. How long will I have to stay there, doctor? That depends on how fast you get well, replied the doctor. Not long, I hope. Perhaps only a few days. A few days, repeated Katie in a despairing tone. After the doctor was gone, Aunt Izzy and Debbie lifted Katie and carried her slowly up the stairs. It was not easy, for every motion hurt her, and the sense of being helpless hurt most of all. She couldn't help crying after she was undressed and put into bed. It all seemed so dreadful and strange. If only Papa was here, she thought. But Dr. Carr had gone into the country to see someone who was very sick, and couldn't possibly be back till tomorrow. Such a long, long afternoon as that was. Aunt Izzy sent up some dinner, but Katie couldn't eat. Her lips were parched, and her head ached violently. The sun began to pour in, and the room grew quite warm. Flies buzzed in the window and tormented her by lighting on her face. Little prickles of pain ran up and down her back. She lay with her eyes shut because it hurt to keep them open, and all sorts of uneasy thoughts went rushing through her mind. "'Perhaps, if my back is really sprained, I shall have to lie here as much as a week,' she said to herself. "'Oh, dear, dear, I can't. The vacation is only eight weeks, and I was going to do such lovely things. How can people be as patient as Cousin Helen when they have to lie still? Won't she be sorry when she hears? Was it really yesterday that she went away? It seems a year. If only I hadn't gotten to that nasty old swing.' And then Katie began to imagine how it would have been if she hadn't, and how she and Clover had meant to go to Paradise that afternoon. They might have been there under the cool trees now. As these thoughts ran through her mind, her head grew hotter and her position in the bed more uncomfortable. Suddenly she became conscious that the glaring light from the window was shaded, and that the wind seemed to be blowing freshly over her. She opened her heavy eyes. The blinds were shut, and there, beside the bed, sat little Elsie, fanning her with a palm leaf. "'Did I wake you up, Katie?' she asked in a timid voice. Katie looked at her with startled, amazed eyes. 
don't be frightened said elsie i won't disturb you johnny and me are so sorry you're sick and her little lips trembled but we mean to keep real quiet and never bang the nursery door or make noises on the stairs till you're well again and i've brought you something real nice some of it's from john and some from me it's because you got tumbled out of the swing see and elsie pointed triumphantly to a chair which she had pulled up close to the bed and on which were solemnly set forth first a pewter tea-set second a box with a glass lid on which flowers were painted third a jointed doll fourth a transparent slate and lastly two new lead pencils they're all yours yours to keep said generous little elsie you can have pickery too if you want only he's pretty big and i'm afraid he'd be lonely without me don't you like the things katie they're real pretty it seemed to katie as if the hottest sort of a coal of fire was burning into the top of her head as she looked at the treasures on the chair and then at elsie's face all lighted up with affectionate self-sacrifice she tried to speak but began to cry instead which frightened elsie very much does it hurt you so bad she asked crying too from sympathy oh no it isn't that sobbed katie but i was so cross to you this morning elsie and pushed you oh please forgive me please do why it's got well said elsie surprised aunt izzie put a thing out of a bottle on it and the bump all went away shall i go and ask her to put some on you too i will and she ran toward the door oh no cried katie don't go away elsie come here and kiss me instead elsie turned as if doubtful whether this invitation could be meant for her katie held out her arms elsie ran right into them and the big sister and the little exchanged an embrace which seemed to bring their hearts closer together than they had ever been before you're the most precious little darling murmured katie clasping elsie tight i've been real horrid to you elsie but i'll never be again you shall play with me and clover and cece just as much as you like and write notes in all the post offices and everything else oh goody goody cried elsie executing little skips of transport how sweet you are katie i mean to love you next best to cousin helen and papa and racking her brains for some way of repaying this wonderful kindness i'll tell you the secret if you want me to very much i guess cousin helen would let me no said katie never mind about the secret i don't want you to tell it to me sit down by the bed and fan me some more instead no persisted elsie who now that she had made up her mind to part with the treasured secret could not bear to be stopped cousin helen gave me a half dollar and told me to give it to debbie and tell her she was much obliged to her for making her such nice things to eat and i did and debbie was real pleased and i wrote cousin helen a letter and told her that debbie liked the half dollar that's the secret isn't it a nice one only you mustn't tell anybody about it ever just as long as you live no said katie smiling faintly i won't all the rest of the afternoon elsie sat beside the bed with her palm leaf fan keeping off the flies and shooing away the other children when they peeped in at the door do you really like to have me here she asked more than once and smiled oh so triumphantly when katie said yes but though katie said yes i'm afraid it was only half the truth for the sight of the dear little forgiving girl whom she had treated unkindly gave her more pain than pleasure i'll be so good to her when i get well she thought to herself tossing uneasily to and fro aunt izzie slept in her room that night katie was feverish when morning came and dr carr returned he found her in a good deal of pain hot and restless with wide open anxious eyes papa she cried first thing must i lie here as much as a week my darling i'm afraid you must replied her father who looked worried and very grave dear dear sobbed katie how can i bear it end of chapter eight recording by hattie lennox